Welcome to Brand Talk, another way to talk. We're going to talk about business. We talk about brands that are in the news, your brand. We talk about brands that you use and you love every day. We have a different point of view. There's no yelling. There's no screaming. Just good old conversation. <laughs> Welcome to Brand Talk, another way to talk with your host, Dr. John Tantillo. And now here is the host of Brand Talk, John Tantillo. Hey everybody, it's uh, John Tantillo, aka JT, aka Dr. John Tantillo. And I guess I have to say Dr. John Tantillo today because I am with a guest today who's not only a guest, uh, she's a very, very dear friend. And her name is Dr. Annabelle, Annabelle, I should say, Bugatti. And she's a PhD. She's a author, speaking speaker, and couples expert. Uh, in giving, uh, in addition to giving workshops on leadership and atta and attachment, she currently has a thriving private therapy practice in Las Vegas, Nevada, where she also leads local therapists in learning the practice of emotionally focused therapy. Uh, we'll find out what that is, uh, I'm sure, uh, because I don't know what that is. Uh, every generation, and I had, uh, mine was in the 80s when I w was first starting in psychology, and we'll talk a little bit about that, not to step on what we will talk about with uh, Annabelle, um, but let me finish reading this wonderful bio. Uh, she's been featured in Counseling Today, uh, Good Day Street Talk, Your Tango, and has a successful podcast, We Heart Therapy. Without further ado, Annabelle Bugatti, so glad to join us today on brand talk welcome uh, dr annabelle or as you would like to be called dr bell how are you doing i'm great i'm great or some some folks call me dr bugatti people tend to really like my last name which is nice so i oh, oh you, why yes it's a famous brand right B the bugatti brand Right. And I mean, I don't tell your husband that, otherwise there'll be uh, no talking to him. He's and he's a brand onto himself. But this is yeah. not about him. This is right. all about you today, and about what you're gonna, w what's going on in the wonderful world of psychology. And you are a psychologist. You're not a psychiatrist. Why don't you explain, since we, we we're talking about brands here? What's the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist? What is that crackling? Is so that you? Actually, I'm a marriage and family therapist, but I'm a psychotherapist just the same as a psychologist. But a psychiatrist is actually a medical doctor who specializes in mental health. They're the ones that write the prescriptions for the psychiatric medications right. that work in psychiatric hospitals. Some of them do work in private practice and do do counseling. Um, although it's my experience that it more in the recent years, psychiatrists tend to do less counseling and more just medically prescribing. And they do view mental health through the medical lens, which is you are somebody with an illness, somebody who's sick and need a medical intervention with medication versus a psychologist. Um, and any licensed psychotherapist, you could be a social worker or a uh, mental health counselor, professional counselor, or a marriage and family therapist. And you can still do one-on-one -on -one or couples counseling, depending on your training and specialty. Um, psychologists also tend to do more testing. Um, they, some states have authorized them to start writing prescriptions, which is really new, but psychologists, depending on their orientation, may also abide by the medical model. They will do the talk therapy. Um, they can testify in court, you know, they'll do, do the uh, psychological testing. 
interesting. Mm -hmm. Whereas a psychotherapist is just somebody that you're going to go to for counseling, for therapy, if you're an individual or a couple looking for help. So there are social workers who go into private practice, uh, um, but the bulk of a lot of social workers do appear in agency settings, mental health clinics, um, those types of things. But yeah, marriage and family therapists, we, we can treat basically everything. So. Uh, uh, okay. Well, okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you first. You do not consider yourself, you are not a psychologist then. You are a psychotherapist. Yes, yeah, so a psychologist am is I, a Am I correct? Yeah, a psychologist is an actual type of license, and it's a type of uh, degree program you would go to. Um, so their, their testing, their, their programs will be a little bit, bit different, even though they may see a lot of the same clients and do the same work that I do as a license. Some marriage and family therapists. Okay. They, they may have a bigger range of things that they are allowed to do, like psychological testing, but that's not something that I feel. Uh, that I okay. Uh, all right. I'm, I'm going to probably confuse this a little bit because when I was um, coming up, uh, when I got my PhD in 1980 from Hofstra University, is that you, uh, Annabelle, the crackling? No idea where that's coming from. Okay. Right here too. It, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, to be a New York State licensed psychologist in 1980, this was the criteria. Um, well, uh, uh, okay. And if you became a New York State licensed psychologist, you could hang out your door, John Tantillo, psychotherapist, psychologist. In other words, that license gave you the right to be able to use the word psycho or uh, in front or as a as a um, designation. Okay, and to do that, you needed a PhD in any branch of psychology. So it didn't have to be clinical psychology. It could be any degree in psychology. And then you would have to do um, a, in, um, a residency, okay, an internship and a residency of which teaching could be considered part of that for three years and then you would have to you would be then able to sit in to the licensing exam and then you could be a be designated a psychologist and then do therapy now that could have all changed okay as far as I know. So I, I, I'm sorry for maybe making this an academic, but I, I, want, I needed to kind of analyze this. Yeah, well, well, I can, so the field of mental health and counseling has come a long way. Sure. What they found back then when people could get a general PhD in psychology, they found that just having an understanding of psychology because it is so broad, isn't necessarily specialized enough to be doing an adequate job at psychotherapy and the the field of psychotherapy yeah. itself the profession has gone through a lot of evolutions and growth as they've learned what is effective what's not effective and then you have more schools of thought more programs that have come available and new licenses that have gotten since ratified so and depending on the state you're in will de depend on so psychologists right type of um therapist talk to therapist that was ratified that didn't require a medical degree. Although clinical psychology programs now are more competitive to get into than medical school. But some states, you know, the next license to be ratified was social workers. So you'll have more social workers in some states than you do in others. And, you know, other states, marriage and family therapy became the next license to be ratified. So you may see more of those in some states. So just more and more um, per professions as they've honed the practice of counseling and therapy. You no longer need a PhD 
be to have a clinical practice, right. but right. to have that. Yeah. Just my own yeah. personal standard of excellence. And yeah. Well, and, and to make matters even more uh, confusing, uh, there's this there's this field now of um, coaching, and where does that where does coaching come in to the counseling area? Yeah, so so I, I throw that out to you. Yeah, coaching is really hard. In my sense, is eventually they're going to have to come to a place where they regulate it because as coaches, literally, like there's no it's not regulated. So anybody could hang a shingle out calling themselves a coach. They may or may not have any training in mental health. Um, it's just somebody who says, oh, I decided that I'm great at life, so I'm going to tell you how to do life. And a lot of them are doing great harm. And, and, you know, the field of counseling and psychology is very protected. So there are actually laws. If you're opening a practice for yourself and using certain words, there are terms that are protected. But if you are not licensed, who are they really going to go after? You have to cause really major harm for them them to sue yeah. you perfectly but you know if you're a therapist you know or you're an intern claiming to be a licensed therapist you know you, you could get into big trouble if you're using certain words that sure. are protected in yeah. accordance with your degree or your licensing yeah. so you have to be careful yeah. but coaching is that new, new gray area and you know again i'd be very skeptical of somebody who said you know no nah, i don't really want to get a degree and, and know how to really help people. I'm just going to dispense my advice and not have any formal training. Just a lot of yeah. um, Now, when I was uh, uh, studying studying my uh, for my uh, doctorate in the class, and I have one one really really long time Ooh. friend. Uh, her name is Dr. Amy Singer. I hope she doesn't kill me when I, when I, I mention her name. Uh, boy, uh, she was one of the smartest kids. I should kill her. Maybe she'll kill me. She might like it, me calling her a kid. Uh, but she was uh, really uh, the tops in the class. And um, uh, I would say it was maybe 60% men and 40% women. And uh, the women were no slouches. Um, is that what you found in your class or was it more 50 50 or was it more 60 40 women in, in your counseling now. class? Go ahead. Yeah, it's completely opposite now. The field of counseling is now dominated 80% women. Wow. And that, I kind of thought it might have skewed that way. And I wanted the, I wanted women to, you know, I wanted that to get out because at Brand Talk here, we like to uh, present how different brands have different target markets. So this is a great field for a woman to get into. And I, I throw it back to you on that. Go ahead. I think that's sort of a an evolutionary reason for that as as we've started to again understand what's effective and what's not effective and realizing, you know, men socially are not taught to deeply go, go into emotions and experience their emotions, whereas women it's it's sort of a given and it's more mm -hmm. it's accepted, it's more okay. So it seems like a natural fit with the the way that women are. Um, now, again, there are lots of great male therapists that have mastered this and have gotten trained, and they're fantastic. And yeah. there are lots of women that aren't great at doing emotions either. I'm, I'm just giving a little bit of historical context is that socially, yeah. evolutionary speaking, it's always been generally more acceptable for women to interact with emotions and talk about emotions and talk about their feelings. So it makes sense that it would be more of a natural fit for women. And I'm going to take what you said to another level. And I probably am going to get into a lot of trouble for saying this, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I, I think you should give credit where credit is due. I think that women make better physicians than men do as far as a bedside manner because of the very thing that you're mentioning, 
that that uh, idea of um, being able to relate to the patient. And I had to, and I, I just had my appointment today with my endocrinologist, uh, Dr. Sina, and she is the best. And before I got to Dr. Sina, I had three male endocrinologists who were beast animals. They were, you will do as I say, you will do this so that otherwise we're going to chop your fingers off. You know, I, I just couldn't believe it. I would go to these, these doctor's appointments and I would be in terror. And on one day I picked up the phone and I said, I'm not coming, Dr. So-and-so. I am not coming to see you today because it's just so stressful. I can't put up with it. I just can't do it. And I went on the internet and I found her and I was a real idiot. I basically said, look, I've been to three endocrinologists. They've all been men. They all been horror shows. What are you going to do differently? And what happened was she just, we, it, we just hit it off. And it was, okay, these are your numbers, and this is what we're going to have to do. Fast forward seven years, my A1C, and for those people who don't know what an A1C is, it's the average uh, glucose number that uh, that is taken to know how bad your diabetes is, and you, they want it under seven. Mine for two readings for the last six months were under seven. It was 6.9 and 6.8. She couldn't believe it. She said, this is terrific. I'd like you to talk a little bit about this whole idea of bedside manner and what you do to make it work and make your patients happy. Sorry, I went off so long on that. Oh, you're fine. Well, and this this idea of bedside manner is actually, it's so complex. And I actually do some workshops with medical professionals about how to increase bedside manner because ultimately, ultimately about the, the quality of bedside manner. They don't want to go to the doctors. They're going to complain to their insurance companies. The insurance company is going to drop people from their recommended list. So, you know, there's also a business reason for having good bedside manners because it's going to, you know, increase your client retention and increase you with the insurance panels, make sure that you don't get dropped. But you know, in terms of like gender and emotions, the whole profession of, of medicine, of being a physician is very complex with emotions because, you know, when you just kind of like when you're in the military, you know, when you are in these situations, you're really having people's lives in your hands. And that's very scary. And if you were in tune with all the emotions that come along with that, it would be very hard to function, right? Um, you know, soldiers, they go into battle. If they're feeling the fear and the anger and all the emotions, it would be very hard for them to be able to focus and survive, right? And it's the same with doctors. Sure. You know, people die on their table all the time. I mean, not because they're doing something bad, but just people die, right? And to feel everything that happens or to feel the pain of causing someone else pain, you'd never be able to perform surgery on someone. So there is a survival function um, that doctors have had to try to override the emotional system. But what happens is emotions are also part of the survival system because they're part of attachment. And attachment is wired through the amygdala, the survival part of the brain, the part of the brain responsible for our survival instincts. So attachment is survival. And the science is very clear that we do better together, especially when it comes to existential danger. So you know, people are in the doctor's office and they have, and look, there are great male 
physicians out there who have conquered bedside manner, but it's like the, the double bind of being a doctor is they forget how to turn, how to lean back into the emotions and they forget to see the human that they're treating. And so, you know, I've had clients who've come in and have had some terminal illnesses or chronic illnesses that have impacted their life and created limitations. So we've had to talk about the psychological impact, but I've had a lot of people be traumatized by their physicians where they go in and the physician is saying, oh, you've been having a series of heart attacks in your sleep. And now, and they just delivered it like no big deal. And now my client is plunged into this crisis. Like, oh my gosh, am I going to die every single night? I'm scared to death to go to sleep, that I'm going to have a heart attack and I'm not going to wake up. So now they have all this anxiety, their body's powering itself back up and they're not able to sleep. So their body's not getting the restorative rest. And then the very thing they don't want to have happen is going to happen because emotions live in your nervous system. So now they're having cortisol and adrenaline flooding through their body, which is not good if you already have a stressed heart. So, you know, just to be able to sit with the human in front of you when you're handing them a death sentence in some cases, right? Terminal illness, some form of cancer that's not curable, right? If we fail to see that there is a human being whose life is about to to be changed by the news we are delivering. We miss the boat right there and we don't even realize the impact that's gonna have on the person leaving our office. How well they can function, how well they get through the next couple days. And you know, another thing is I find this so interesting and I feel like physicians should add this to their assessment list is oftentimes they'll have clients who have all these physical symptoms and yet there's, they can't find anything medically wrong with them. You know, they'll have stomach issues or headaches. They do blood work, they do MRIs, everything they can, and they're coming up empty. And my first instinct is always look at how they regulate emotions because emotions live in the body. And we know, so the word emotion in and of itself comes from the Latin emovere, to move, and more specifically to move out. Pain demands to be felt. It demands to move out of your body. That's its natural trajectory. But people who are avoidant of feeling their emotions, who try to push them down and trap them in their bodies, they're not getting the benefit of that release that secure connection could provide. It's, it's been proven by science that getting secure attachment connection in distress actually causes your brain to release different hormones, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, all of these that help counteract the stress and pain hormones, the stress hormones in your body like adrenaline and cortisol. But if you're dealing it with it on your own, you're not getting those other really good hormones in your body and your body is left swimming in adrenaline and cortisol. And so you're numbing that out. Guess where, guess where it's going to, right? Is it doesn't just go nowhere. It stays in your body and starts attacking your organs. And so if you're marinating and this is like a lifelong process where you just contain your anger and you never express it even in a healthy way or get help for it or try to understand it or any part of your emotions, you know, it's going to show up in your body. And so I have clients all the time that have stomach issues and I, and I look at them and they're like, I've got rage issues. Well, your stomach issues are starting to make total sense to me now. It's, it doesn't surprise me that your doctor's not able to find something because it's not necessarily medical but what happens to you emotionally also happens to you physically right right you're listening to dr annabelle bogatti and this is brand talk which you can hear every thursday at 3 p.m so your practice you specialize in couples therapy so you do two people at the same time it's not one individually uh, how, how do you go about doing your therapy with in in the couple space well i do see individuals as well as couples but couples is a very special type of therapy it requires you to be a great an effective couples therapist, you need a lot of continued advanced training, which I've dedicated myself to. And, you know, as you mentioned before, I'm an EFT therapist, emotionally focused therapy, which has been pioneered by Dr. Sue Johnson. And it's all about attachment. And our perspective in EFT is that we don't view people as sick or pathological. We see the humanness inside of them. We understand that there's probably a good reason why they're doing what they 
do. It's just the way that they're trying to do it isn't effective in helping them do that. And in fact, maybe actually causing more harm to their life or their spouse or their relationship. So we sort of try to map out and you've got to hold both people in that space and build a relationship with both, which can be really challenging sometimes when, you know, one person is doing a lot of attacking or hurting, you know, it can be easier to have more empathy for the person being hurt. But, you know, people usually attack and they behave in those ways because they're in pain and they don't know how to express it in a healthy way. So my job is to reach in below what I see the surface and to see somebody's heart and to dig out that intention, that pain at the core and see it and hear it and then transform it so that they can start to share and express it through behaviors and communication in a way that's healthy and more effective. And that brings connection instead of disconnection. Okay. What, now, what would you say are uh, some indicators uh, uh, that would uh, set a red flag to a couple uh, that they would be in need of your services? What, why would they, uh, what behaviors would they be exhibiting uh, in their in their relationship to warrant a visit to your office? Well, I think the best um, strategy is to, I think everybody honestly could use counseling, even a little bit of tune up. And the problem is you don't want to wait till you're drowning to learn how to swim. And that's what a lot of couples do is they, they wait till they're in sort of using a medical metaphor. People come into me when their marriage is coding and expect me to bring it back to life. And that can be very hard to do. And yeah. there are a lot of signs a lot of, along the way. And most often the common sign that comes up with couples is when they keep getting stuck, having the same fight over and over and over, and they're not able to find a way out of it. And it just feels like wash, rinse and repeat. It doesn't matter if we're arguing about the dishwasher or the kid's school or finances or sex. And as we yeah. keep getting stuck in this place, we get more and more disconnected and our connection starts praying. We're not bonding together. We're not having as much fun. We're not playing. We're not communicating. I mean, everything starts to fall into this cavern. But it's just amazing that people will minimize and downplay like, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, we don't we'll just sweep it under the carpet. These things don't get better magically on their own by osmosis. Right. You have yeah. to be intentional. And there's also a lot of pride that people have or, or shame, right? That, oh, I don't need to tell someone else my business. I don't need to open up. Well, maybe you do because look at your relationship. It's falling apart, right? So right. what's the real danger to going to somebody and getting some help? You know, we weren't right. all born knowing how to do relationships. Yet this is this myth, right? And the reasons why people used to enter into marriages, you know, before probably like the 60s and 70s, which was much different, you know, post industrial revolution and even up through the industrial revolution, up through the 50s, people entered marriage. Yes, there was a romantic attachment, of course, was an element of it, but there was far more drive for economic survival. And now that people know how to survive economically on their own, they're able to make different choices on their marital partners based more on connection and attachment, which is more of an enlightenment. You know, it's, it's a luxury. Back then, people stayed in jobs that they hated with bosses that they hated just to pay the bills, right? They didn't yeah. have the luxury of thinking, how do I want to have meaning out of my job in my workplace and I could be happier? People just didn't yeah. think that way. And they also didn't question their marriages. They just put up with things that weren't working well. They didn't really put a lot of effort into it. And so these people ended up, now that your generation's forward, they're having children and grandchildren, that they're fostering down the same behavioral strategies, even though the times have changed and the reasons that we're entering into relationships are, are different. So now we have new reasons, but we're not met with different, we're not met with different skills. So people yeah. aren't being taught how to do healthy relationships. And then you have broken people not resolving their issues, getting into marriage, expecting marriage to be like a magic button or a magic carpet that suddenly we're going to get into it. And, and marriage 
in and of itself is going to make everything better. And then mm. when it falls apart, they blame marriage and say, oh, the institution yeah. of marriage is terrible. It gets a bad rap. No, it's not. Marriage is fantastic. And if you love someone and want to spend your entire life with them, why wouldn't you offer them that protection that comes from the law? If, if you're on your bedside, your deathbed, would you not want them to be able to be there and not have to fight with the hospital and insurance company to go, you're not, you're not legally married, we can't talk to you kind of stuff, you know? When people say, oh, it's just a piece of paper, that's, that's silly, right? If it was just a piece mm -hmm. of paper, then what's the big deal of doing it, right? Why are you right. avoiding it so much? Money is a piece of paper, but it means a lot. My diploma sits on a piece of paper. That means a lot. These papers mean something and people know that and use that. You know, that's just a thing. Like I'm afraid to get married as if not getting married is going to save us from some heartache or some mess when this falls apart. And if it does fall apart, even if you're not married, it still hurts the same way, still impacts you the same way. And there are work yeah. around, you know, when you get married, you can do prenups. There's all kinds of legal paperwork to help you with that. So it shouldn't be a barrier to fully committing. And, you know, you can't go into a relationship half committing with your heart. I'm just going to put 75% of my heart there. You know, I'm just too afraid to fully put all my eggs in this basket. So you want 100% return on a 75, 50% commitment. It's not really going to work that way. You have to put 100% into a relationship if you want to have the benefits come out. So you can't enter it doing half half the work or half committing your heart and expect it to work it's just recipe for failure yeah this is a brand talk and we're speaking with dr annabelle bogatti about counseling so are the happiest marriages without children I wouldn't say that necessarily. No, well, that's what the data says. Well, statistics will show that that there is higher divorce among people with children. Again, um, yes. it, it goes back to the reasons that people enter into marriage, the reasons why people stay in a bad marriage, and what people are doing while they're in the marriage. A lot of people, and this is an old belief that I think came out from the 1950s and, again, hasn't been taught you do not make a bad relationship better by adding a child, but a lot of people do that. Um, and just a lot of people, when things start going downhill, they don't think about, you know, going to get help. You know, like Kobe Bryant or, you know, mm -hmm. Magic Fox and any of the, like these famous Tiger Woods did not become professional athletes without a coach, without a professional coming in. They may have had some natural skills and ability, but it's nothing without having that professional coach. So, you know, if you want to have that kind of marriage where it's a top performer, right? If you want the Maserati of marriages, you can't you can't give it the same maintenance that you would like a beater car, right? You got to give right. Maserati maintenance if you want the Maserati of marriages. And that means being able to call in a professional when it's needed. And a lot of people, when they have kids enter the picture, all their focus goes on to their kids. So they start neglecting their marriage. And whatever bad habits were there before the kids came in that didn't get worked on are now getting amplified and just continuing and getting worse over time, which follows the basic laws of motion. An object in motion will stay at motion unless acted on mm -hmm. by an outside force. Bad yeah. habits will stay bad habits until it's acted upon. Whether you add kids or not, it's not going to make it better. Yeah. Well, you know, there's uh, Clarence Darrell, the great uh, legal mind of the uh, of the 20th century, who did the Scopes trial, he had a famous expression, our parents ruined the first half of our lives and our children the second half. And, uh, I, <laughs> and um, I, I was of the belief that my, my, my childhood was, uh, was um, uh, very, very different. And I wasn't going to get the second half <laughs> Of my of my life messed up and but I, I have so many surrogate children in my life um, uh, so that's kind of it's it is all kind of interesting but I I understand how children can in fact challenge a relationship and um, 
you know, in the old days, I would have been chauvinistic and say it was the woman uh, that always wanted the children. And that's not necessarily uh, the case. Uh, that uh, today, uh, even men want to have children for the fact that they're heading, they're getting older and they want to leave something behind. And how do you feel about that? Well, and look, part of it is understanding research and research can be misleading. And what, what ends up happening here is this fallacy that correlation equals causation. When, when you're presented with information like, oh, divorce is higher among people with children, what starts to happen is people are assuming that having children causes an increase in divorce. You don't actually know that. That can just be merely coincidental. It doesn't point to say that right. that's a leading cause. It's just saying they find this among this population. And what I find among people is, again, unhealthy people coming into a relationship and they knew there were problems in the marriage, but then kids came along and that complicated the process. They decided to stick with it, to stick it out because they didn't want to divorce because of the children. And then they're waiting till their children grow up or get to a certain age before they divorce. And honestly, your kids can see right through that. I have so many adult right. clients who know my parents just stayed together, you know, until we left and, and we knew they were unhappy. We wish they had just gotten divorced. And, you know, an intact family unit is, is healthy, you know, is good, but it has to be a healthy family. You know, the research is very clear that there is definitely a relationship among the quality of, of connection. So if two parents live in the same home with the ch children, if they have an intact family unit, but everybody's at war with each other, your kids can be just as messed up as somebody who's divorced, right? But if people divorce and they have a great co-parenting relationship and they're able to come together and be great partners as co-parents, but not necessarily marital partners, your children can be healthy and well-adjusted. The real determinant is whether or not the parents get along and ha can have a good relationship, whether that's under the same roof or if they're separate and have a better relationship. If they're under the same roof or divorced and they're at war with each other, that's what's going to impact the children and mm -hmm. and affect their psychological adjustment. So, yeah. you know, the parents' relationship is the most important relationship within the family system, and it is the relationship from which all others filter out of. Okay, so the, what do you do in this case? A woman comes to you with her husband and says, uh, we're, not, we're simply not getting along. Uh, what's going on here is where we uh, constantly are fighting uh, about money and uh, uh, everything is a big project. Uh, we don't have time uh, with each other, enough time with each other. And do you, with that kind of a situation, and the husband is kind of um, uh, disaffected. He's, he, he really does not want to be there. Is this a good case that what she should be doing is she should be going for the therapy or do you think both of them should be going for the therapy in the hopes that they can become part of the same page? I mean, I have my, how I would play it, uh, but I like the doctor to, to tell me what you would do in a case like this. Well, so really the answer is, you know, it depends on their goals. If both of them would like to stay in the relationship, do they want to stay in the relationship and have that relationship get better? Or do they want to stay in the relationship and have it continuing to be disconnected and having that disconnection grow and get worse? So, right. you know, I that not everyone, you know, therapy is not their favorite, you know, therapy can be awesome and it's great and it's amazing and it's transformative. But I understand some people reticence because we talk about things that are very personal that are very private often most of the time we're talking about things that aren't working so well that are not our proudest moments and and i understand that it's uncomfortable to talk about 
our mistakes and the things that we aren't doing so healthy. And a lot of people want to avoid that. But yeah, you know, but for ourselves, yeah, the way I would look at it is that you should make her your client and leave him at home and let her talk about it and let her talk through it. And guess what? She's going to decide. She's going to decide that if he doesn't come to the therapy, I'm out of here because this is not working. This is a waste of time. But to bring somebody in who doesn't want to be there, the fact that he doesn't want to be there is telling us that he doesn't want to maybe be in the marriage. That's he doesn't want to work at it. Go ahead. Prove me wrong. That's actually not true. Most of the time we good. find that that's a, that's are, a, go ahead. Yeah. very Most good. Of the time when somebody's hesitant to come into therapy, it's because they've lost hope that things could be different. A lot of times they've tried to have the conversations. They've tried to do things differently. They feel like they've tried what they can on their own. And they really feel hopeless. Like, you know, I'm just going to throw money at you and you're good. They also think that the therapist is going to pathologize and take, you know, the same gendered partner aside against them. So, you know, there's a lot of right. reasons why people may be hesitant about therapy. And, and again, none of those end up being true. If you have a therapist that gangs up on you, that's, you know, we need to have a talk with the therapist. But, you know, it's really being able to understand what's driving the hesitancy to come into therapy, really being able to sit with them and let them share. Is this because you've lost hope or are you saying that you no longer want to be in the relationship? And if you no longer want to be in the relationship, we need to talk about that and talk about what you guys want to do and how you want to handle this. Getting therapy, even for for the breaking up process is a really good idea too because it helps the couple be able right. to talk about some of the wounds some of the reasons that have gotten them to this place helps them at least have some clarity and the therapist can help the couple break up with dignity minimize as much of the emotional baggage as they can so that they can break up in a healthy way and and end up and have better, more successful future relationships and not carry this, you know, flame of anger or resentment towards their partner for that marriage. So, right. you know, it can help no matter what. You just really have to meet the person where they are and find out what's going on for them rather than just assuming we know why they're doing what they're doing. Well, all I'm trying to say is that I, it's been, since I am a man and since even though I'm a psychologist uh, by training, it's not something that I did for a very long time in my life. And that is see a therapist. I did this uh, when I left the Franciscan brothers. I did this uh, because there were so many things that were going on. And then, and then what I, what I decided is, okay, I, I, I had enough of the uh, self um, uh, analyzing and, uh, and going to uh, uh, the therapist and I decided enough was enough and I moved on. That's not to say that the woman who comes to you or the, or the uh, one of the partners comes to you and seeks advice uh, on what to do regarding the relationship. And maybe what that is, um, is to leave that this, you know, maybe we got together under the wrong circumstances and that I hear this from women all the time. We grew apart and, and men not being as communicative as women are just don't want to deal with the fact that do we even have to talk about this? Let's just end this thing because um, it's over. And I ask you to well, it's, it's respond to that. Way, it's kind of the old school way of doing things again. And it's not our place as a therapist, actually very unethical for us to tell people that they should be breaking up. We oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I didn't mean for you to tell them. Them. I'm saying by you right. letting them vent, they, you know, as they said well, in the Wizard of Oz, you had to come. Clear that just venting is not enough to actually create change or, you know, venting just lets them get it off their chest. But 
It doesn't necessarily bring organization and clarity to what they should do. And if their goal is to stay in the relationship and they would like things to be different, the only way that that's going to happen is if they can get their partner to join them in that work. And again, if that if that wife comes in and she's frustrated over the state of her marriage and she really wants her partner to work on it with her, if she just digs in and gets angry and attacks him, he's going to get defensive and he's going right. to put up his guard, not because he doesn't want to work on the relationship, but because he's feeling attacked. So, you know, if we can approach it differently, understand what his hesitancy is and help her share her heart that, hey, you know, I really love you and I feel like we've grown apart, but I really want to stay in this marriage. Would you be willing to work with me on the marriage? It would feel much different. And this is the thing is that when people come to you, that's not their first approach. They're like browbeating their partner. They're getting very critical, very anxious, very right. angry, and their partner's feeling attacked. They're not hearing, oh, I, you want to stay in the marriage and you love me so much. All they're hearing from their critical partner is how much I suck and how I'm messing up everything. And so they're thinking, why would you want to stay with me when all you do is tell me what an awful spouse I am? Right. It's right. not going to be an effective strategy for getting their partner to work on the marriage. So, you know, I can right. help them, you know, try some different strategies, let their intentions be known in a softer way and see what happens and be more authentic and upfront. And if they do everything they can to meet their goal and that partner just is unwilling. And that's that's really what it comes down to. The only problem that couples cannot overcome is the one that we're not willing to work on. That is the only thing. Does, if you grow point. apart. You can grow back together. If you become incompatible, that's also not a determined. There are lots of people who are complete opposites that have amazing marriages. Again, it's how these things are dealt with. And one of the examples I give my couples comes from this movie, um, Fireproof. It's a great movie. And, you know, they give the analogy of salt and pepper, right? They look different. They smell different, taste different, have completely chemi different chemical compositions, yet they're always together, right? You don't have to be carbon copies of each other to have a great relationship. But if two people don't know how to make a marriage work, it doesn't matter if you're similar or different. You're just bringing those skills that aren't healthy and they're clashing with each other. And so that's where the professional comes along is we can organize this, make sense of it, help see to the heart of things, dig out our goal and help align our strategies with our goals. And if yeah. they don't want to say that we hold up the mirror of reflection and say, okay, this is present reality. This is what you're both saying. Where do we go from here? What do you guys want to do? Let's play this out. If we go this way, what will it look like? If we go this way, what will it look like? Right, right. Um, well, you see, I, I'm not a relationship guy. I, I, I don't think I ever was. Uh, and the reason for that was uh, it always go it always get goes back to one's childhood freud had it right um it all goes back to the fact that my parents were the costanzas in seinfeld and they were always fighting and the way out of not fighting was doing the melina dietrich all i want to do is be left alone and what would happen is that I just didn't want ever to get that close. Maybe I'm getting, I'm, I, I, I'm telling uh, too much here, but that's what makes for good uh, podcast. Maybe you can psychoanalyze me as we talk about this, uh, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti here on Brand Talk on what we, uh, what, I could do to uh, to change that to change that up. Uh, I would do nothing because I'm very very happy. Even though there's a lot of folks that want to marry, still want to marry me up. What they would, what a woman would want to do with a 69 year old goat, uh, I don't know. But nevertheless, it's it's fun to, it's fun to speculate. But um, um, uh, would I, I? You know, I'm thinking about. Would I, what kind of counseling would I, uh, would I go for, uh, if I were to go for counseling and I guess, go ahead. Once I would yeah. use EFT therapy and first off, Freud did not get it all right. 
he had a lot of it spectacularly wrong, as we found. You good, know, that's good. Your behavior was motivated, motivated by unconscious drives and impulse to sexual libido, you know, which really a five-year-old, come on. Um, but he did yeah. write in that it does start with your early childhood experiences. Early really, really what we're talking about, and this was after Freud's time, is attachment. And this is where John Bowlby, the father of attachment science and attachment theory comes in, is that your parents are the first people in the world, or whoever your caregiver is, are the first people in the world that you have a relationship with. And therefore, that right. relationship becomes a blueprint for all other relationships. And so when you grow up in an environment where people are not talking to each other, they're not doing emotions very well, they don't do vulnerability, there's lots of chaos and fighting, then you're going to find a way to adapt to that. And the way you learned is just to avoid getting close. So the message you took out right. of that is in order to maintain peace, I have to not get close. And even though you don't, you haven't gotten married, you still seek attachment relationships. You have certain no. children, you know, you still have attachment relationships. You've just foregone marriage, right? So we would right. say you fall into like the avoidant category, but all creatures are driven towards attachment, right? So even if you don't get married, you're still seeking relationship and you're never not in relationship. Yes. It's just the quality and type and intimacy level of that relationship depends on the type of the relationship. Um, but yeah. you know, not, you know, if somebody does want to get married, if, if they don't, you know, learn to avoid, and even people have learned to avoid, that's what we, we sit and talk about. And we make sense of how did this come to be? And yes, it makes sense that that was the way that you learned to survive, but you're not really, in a lot of cases, people aren't surviving. They're not thriving anymore, that they're feeling yeah. unhappy, they're feeling empty. You know, they do want relationships, but they, they never let people close. And vulnerability in marriage is a strength. I know a lot of people think, oh, it's weakness. No, marriages cannot survive without some level of vulnerability, right? Right. But people have had bad experiences being vulnerable where the people who sh should have protected them and should have been there for them were turning their back on them or committing trauma against them. That mm -hmm. betrays the survival code. And then, of course, their circuitry gets rewired and they learn, OK, well, what I've associated from that is that I just need to not be in relationship or close relationship. But then because I never let people really close, no one ever really gets to know me and I never fully feel loved or accepted for who I am because I never let people see that. But again, I've learned that if I do let people see that, I could be abandoned, rejected, yeah. manipulated, used, whatever. So it's a double bind. So we yeah. work on all that. We make sense of it together. Yeah. Well, you see, one of the uh, uh, issues that I have is that I left home at um, 18 years old to become a Franciscan brother or Franciscan monk. And there was training involved. And the training that was involved was being able to establish a relationship with God and uh, to be learn how to be alone with oneself so that you could, in fact, uh, relate to God and that you could let the, the Holy Spirit um, uh, come into you and affect your point of view and your life. Now, that's context so when this, everybody, uh, what's that? There's, let me Pardon? give you a little context on there. So a lot of this comes from the teachings of Paul, who is an apostle, who believed that people shouldn't get married, that, you know, they should only get married if they're burning in their loins with desire so that they avoid sin. But he, Paul himself believed that it was easier to be closer in connection with God, to be alone and worship God and only God. And, you know, relationships were not. But remember, God created Adam and Eve. He said it's not good for man to be alone. God created attachment so much so that he wired attachment into our survival mechanisms, into our neurology, into our brain chemistry, into our physiology to ensure that we would keep fighting for connection, that bonding was part of our survival. So it's like the more I understand attachment, the more I know that God was a genius when he designed our systems. It's a perfect right. system. Sure, sure. So I get why they sure. did what they did. 
you know, but their focus was different, was not on having relationship. They also believed in having minimal amount of stuff. You don't want to be attached to material possessions and because it's all about connection to God. And if that is how you want to come at your life, then great. That makes sense, right? But you're still having attachment and your attachment is to God. That's your your ultimate attachment figure. Well, uh, my that's what my nervous master uh, taught me, and he did a very good job. And he just passed away about two years ago. His name was Brother Jude, and um, you know, and when I was in Oyster Bay, Long Island, in Upper Brookville, in the old Wheeler Estate, which was this fifty-room uh, mansion on twenty-six acres of the finest real estate on Long Island. Uh, yeah, exactly. It was, oh, uh, was just oh, absolutely wonderful, and I got great training on how to be alone. Okay, and and um, and happy being alone. But it just reinforced your way of relating and your way well, of surviving. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and um, and that's why. Thank the dear Lord, I decided there were there were two opportunities I had to get married. And one and both of them, both of these gals, uh basically said, John, we gotta end this because there's just no way you're the marrying type. Uh one I don't uh is a Facebook friend. Who's uh, who I don't see, and one is a Facebook friend who I just got off the phone with, and she was a former student at St. John's, and she's such a dear, 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 dear friend, and we we talk politics all the time, and she's wonderful. We go out for dinner, and you've seen and you've seen her uh, on my Facebook. Her name is Colleen. We'll leave it. I won't. I won't totally uh out her but uh, colleen and uh i mean she was honest we used to go to the hamptons together we used to go to the clubs together get into trouble together you know we it, we, it was wonderful but we both realized or she realized it more than me because i wouldn't have the heart to break it up because that's the kind of guy i was but she is absolutely the most wonderful person in the world to be really, you know, uh, honest about it. And um, uh, my point being is that there were two opportunities and the opportunities never, never really uh, came to fulfillment because uh, uh, on, bo on, both on both sides, it was the women that said it because I wasn't the one that was going to uh, stop it. Go ahead. You can respond to uh my uh my peter pan right for you and all people are called to different things right i mean you still sure. do not lack attachment relationships in your life Never. and you know your right. life of them which certainly you know is amazing and but not everyone was called for that you know so if that's if that was your calling then of course you know your life is going to build to suit and you're yeah. not going to end up coming to therapy because you want to get married right yeah but other people you know are wanting that it's going to be uh, and different. and i never proselytize i never ever proselytize where i will i will portion young people who come to me is um i will say don't make a mistake be sure that this is what you want to do because you're not only affecting your life, you're affecting somebody else's life. So if you're not sure about it, just think about it. Um, I Dr. Anna, yeah. I think uh, people don't vet partners enough and they don't work on getting healthy so that they are, have a better chance of picking a healthy partner and having a healthy relationship. So I totally agree I, I, with that. Make I, sure absolutely. Right. Absolutely. We only got about 45 more seconds. And before uh, I end, where can people come in contact with you or get in you, contact with you? You can find me on my website, drbugatti.com. I have a book coming out that's going to be available on my website, Relentless Empathy.
working with challenging and resistant clients. Um, you can email me. My phone number is on my website. So www.drbugatti.com. Well, that's great. Well, look, I, I hope I didn't take up too much of the time and that I added to the conversation. And that's Dr. Okay, thanks a lot. This is Dr. John Tantillo thanking Dr. Annabelle, Annabelle Bugatti for being part of Brand Talk. See you next week. And remember to go Brand as well. Bye-bye.